Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Welcome back to the Econ Talk Book Club on the Theory of Moral Sentiments with Dan Klein. Dan, thanks once again for being part of this great experience. My pleasure. So this is our sixth podcast, uh, and we will be covering uh, – our plan today is to cover part six and then go on to talk somewhat briefly about part seven and try to then tie everything uh, – together, whatever that means, or put the book in context a little bit. Um, I want to start, Dan, why don't we start with uh, part six? Okay. For part six, I have a weave of some some of the major themes. There's a lot in part six. It's one of the two longer parts of the book. Um, it's called um, Of the Character of Virtue. And the first sentence is, when we consider the character of any individual, we naturally view it under two different aspects. First, as it may affect his own happiness, and secondly, as it may affect that of other people. So he's concerned about character, the quality of character, and first of all, for the sake of the person, him or herself, um, it's a challenge to take care of yourself. This is clear in his long discussion of prudence, um, and prudence itself depends on, um, as it were, communion with the impartial spectator. But then, um, of course, Smith sees the individual in society, sees the connections uh, between the individual and those around him or her, and develops um, what's sometimes called a social distance theory of uh, sympathy, um, of who it is we care about and pay attention to. And briefly, he's got a, a, something like a concentric circles theory moving out. For, the individual is principally con- concerned about him or herself. Uh, the next level would be the family, friends, neighbors, workmates, uh, moving out citizenship, the nation. Uh, and he does this both by uh, looking at individuals – sometimes talking about people we work with, uh, also talking about people of um, extreme condition, very poor or very rich, also come to our attention and become special, um, you know, people that we, people whose lives, emotions we enter into for one reason or the other. He also does this with respect to societies. Um, so he talks about uh, the nation he and, and nationalism, and he also talks about orders within one country. And by that, he means, I believe, things like guilds, profession, parishes, perhaps. I'm not really sure. He doesn't specify that closely. I see all this in a way as um, different circles of care but also of identity. He does not use the word identity, but when he talks about the nation and your order and so on, I think it's clear that he is talking about identity and in a sense, uh, the seeking of meaning, okay? Meaning, what's most meaningful, I think, is this coordinated sentiment, is this sympathy, is this sense that there's something between me and you that is neither yours nor mine, but ours, and in that sense, larger than us, um, and so this seeking of meaning is what people naturally do. He discusses this kind of structure it has. Again, it's not exactly concentric circles because things like your profession um, and so on can cut kind of laterally. Uh, even, it's not strictly propinquent distance. It's a kind of social distance. You could be close to somebody on the other side of the world because of dealings and interests that are in common. And he talks clearly about um, – characters affecting each other. So there's a kind of externalities here in morals and culture. And um, let me just quickly, uh, well, I won't read it, but he says that, you know, kind of good characters rub off, bad character rubs off. So it is very much of a sort of social, organic thing. Um, 
and as it were, I think a large part of what Six is dealing with is the problem of how to manage meaning seeking. Um, it's very possible for meaning seeking, if you will, those are not his words, but I think it's a fair interpretation. Meaning seeking can become socially destructive. Meaning seeking can take to sort of antisocial forms. And so there's, and, and, and the fear of that and the threat of that suggests two possible ways of managing. One is simply to kind of quell meaning seeking, kind of pull back, be content, sort of with your maybe small, what feels like an insignificant lot, um, just kind of, you know, hold tight, don't pop. And uh, another is to channel it into beneficial ways, to, to suggest how to channel it in, in beneficial ways. Are we talking about the, the, the downside of, of this pursuit of meaning? Are you talking about pride and vanity and how they lead, can lead to destructive acts? Is that what the sections that, that you're thinking of there? Because he talks a lot about the, the, the distinction, two, two things that often get mixed mm-hmm. up, pride and vanity. And he talks about false pride, false vanity, real pride, real vanity, how we perceive them. Uh, he, there's a fascinating passage where he talks – in section where he talks about how uh, somebody who's arrogant or proud – we tend to uh, look up to if they're successful. Even if they're mm-hmm. successful at not right. so good things. But uh, once they're not successful, we really are incredibly disdainful of them. Is that what you're talking about? You're talking about the dangers of meaning seeking? Um, that certainly ties in. But prior to getting to pride versus vanity, which is actually in the self commitment, uh, the self command p- uh, part, um, I'm thinking more about. Um, People getting wrapped up in fetish faction, intoxicated with system, oh, yeah. just any kind of factionalism, uh, especially then that gets somehow joined to possible power of different kinds, uh, can become very, very socially destructive. Um, you know, it, 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 in this part, he's clearly affirming this great abstract sort of propriety uh, of serving the whole of serving the, 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 the whole of society, um, ultimately what he calls universal benevolence. And he is affirming a kind of corresponding duty to that. Um, for example, he says, the good citizen wishes to promote the welfare of the whole. These are not exact quotes, but close. The wise and virtuous man is willing to sacrifice his smaller department in sort of that layered, rippled structure of society, his smaller department to the larger department. So he I just – I, I, yeah. I want to interrupt you there because it, at one point he flips the Chinese earthquake episode on its head, something we talked about either last time or the time before, where he talks about if you were to lose your little finger, uh, if you were to lose your finger, you would be more upset than you would be if you found out that 100 million Chinese had died in an earthquake. And, of course, his punchline to that is that despite that feeling, which is inside his claim is that that's human nature, nobody then says it's a good thing that I should kill 100 million people to save my finger. What he does in then in part six is he – what he talks about the wise man is he reverses that story and he says basically a wise man would give up his finger to save 100 million Chinese. And yes. it's the active versus – uh, it's a different kind of, of positive versus negative justice or benevolence would be a better word, benevolence, that obviously it would be immoral to kill people to save a small amount of pain for yourself. He's now going farther and saying it is moral or wise, as, as you say, as the word he uses. Beneficent it's, maybe. It's wise at least to give up a small pain for yourself if the gain to others is sufficiently large. That's right. And that's a very dramatic – you know. Uh, It's a different statement. That's right. So he's affirming um, looking to do a larger good actually as a source of meaning. But But there's a caution in it. Go ahead. The reason I brought that up is I I, want to make sure that listeners don't confuse, as I know you wouldn't want them to, the idea of sacrificing for the whole or the collective. He means by that, when you say or society, he means people other than yourself. He still has a very individualistic view of what is the good. Yeah. Although he does, of course, have this harmonious machine in the background right. that you're contributing to 
it's yeah. not some it's not a mo- he doesn't have the modern view of society that I would say that modern liberals invoke to justify sacrifice for the collective for the pol- for the political good etc um I'm not sure what you mean by that, and I'm not, so I'm not sure if I agree with that last part. I think he certainly sees um, different acts as you know differently than a lot of the modern liberals or social democrats do about what is good for society. Um, but in some in some sense, I think yeah, like you said, he's in favor of you making personal sacrifices to improve the beauty, the working of the large concatenation, the large machine. Um, but, you know, this is where I wanted to bring in the knowledge problem, which in right. some sense is still just sort of, uh, in my view, um, setting the stage for the whole problem of the of the part. The, he, he then says, the thing is, we don't know enough to make bene- beneficence effective, essentially. He says that um, what we can actually help along and improve um, is very limited by our understanding, by our comprehension. There's some wonderful passages here about local knowledge, about the knowledge problem. And so this, first of all, drives him to, I mean, kind of suggests, strongly suggests um, that his, his recommendation, as it were, for all this is sort of stick to your humble department, as he puts it, stick to yourself, stick to what you know. You know, if we had a society of individuals who all prudently cared for themselves and their immediate, you know, family and so on, we'd have a society that is well cared for. And that's the best way for society to be well cared for and happy is for each person, as it were, to do his own laundry. But I think uh, I I disagree with you a little bit. It seems to me he'd be happy for for people to do each other's laundry, <laughs> which is a which is an unfortunate um, uh, choice of example, Dan, because it, it is the it's what what people who are critical of declining manufacturing in the United States view as the future of the United States. That you know the, it, the claim is we become a service economy, and and he said their standard argument is you can't get rich doing each other's laundry. Meaning you know if we're all just mm-hmm. in the service sector, we're not making anything, we're all going to be poor. That's a whole, um, I think, misunderstanding of what economics is about and fund- an economy. But just say fundamentally, if but we're, I'm not talking about people specializing I know, in doing I know, other no, people's no, laundry. I'm talking about everyone doing <laughs> someone else's other. laundry. Yeah, no, I know. So, um, <laughs> but I, it seems to me Smith would be very eager for people to be benevolent to each other rather than merely prudent about their own circle. But the knowledge problem is part of the reason I think he is. Uh, not as enthusiastic about that as he might otherwise be. And in part seven, which we'll come to in a little bit, he very explicitly says that you can't have benevolence as the only virtue. You've got to have prudence and you've got to have uh, justice because he says you know, God can have benevolence because God knows what everybody mm-hmm. needs and, and you know the the person with perfect the, – the being with perfect knowledge mm-hmm. can solve those problems. But he says since we're – we can't have that knowledge. We need these other virtues of prudence and, and justice to push us in the right direction. If we only tried benevolence, we really wouldn't know what to do. And you know, just example I use in my latest book of that is that without prices, if you sat down and said, God gave me gifts or nature gave me gifts, and I want to use them to serve humanity. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to be selfish. How would you begin to know right. <laughs> without prices what is the best use of your scarce time and and that's an right. effort, and so I think for for that's a very poor, powerful, important lesson for me. But I think to keep it in 1759 for Smith, the way I take it to be is that is it he he doesn't say it's a bad thing that you go beyond your little humble department. In fact, it'd be a good thing, but it's not easy to do. Right. And in a sense, that what you were just saying leads into what we said, I think, at the outset about wealth and nations being an extension of this, because there he's showing that in pursuing prudence through honest profit, you are helping others, even though that motive gets often gets lost um, or de- de-emphasized because you're pursuing profit. But it can be done also with uh, an awareness, right, uh, uh, about uh, the larger benefits of 
say, bu- bu- building a laundromat and actually specializing in doing other people's laundry. Yeah, I, I, I find it remarkable that people misunderstand the the modern or ancient economy and assume that because you're making a profit, you can't be benevolent. Right. I mean, wh- why can't you get pleasure from the money you earn and the services you yeah. provide? And every single successful business – as I've also written about, uh, nobody has a motto for their workforce, uh, the highest highest prices and the lowest costs. Or our motto is make a lot of profit, even socially, but socially responsible. That That's no business's mission statement, no business's motto. The motto that most businesses adapt, adopt is something about serving their customers and is uh, – But it's never trusted because it is mixed, but you ne- and we never know motives. You shouldn't trust it. You shouldn't trust it, but it's clear that successful organizations in a modern, in a modern business world inculcate uh, a genuine benevolence alongside the profit motive and look for employees who get yeah. pleasure from helping other people. You know, One of my favorite examples of this is the Ritz-Carlton. The Ritz-Carlton's motto, and you can ask any Ritz-Carlton employee this, say, what's the Ritz's motto? Every single employee will tell you immediately their motto is, ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. Uh-huh. And one of my favorite things about the Ritz is that if you get lost in a Ritz and you say, where's ballroom seven or you know, where's the concierge, they don't tell you. They don't point down the hall and say, you take a left. They escort you to the spot yeah. that, you, that you want. Now, that can be done in two ways. That can be done as, oh, this is a nuisance. This is the rule. I might get caught. But I think they try to find employees who think it's nice to help people not be lost, and that's going to be a better hotel yeah. than than people who are purely self interested, who view work as a nuisance and helping people as a pain in the neck. Yeah, Togo is a sandwich shop on the West Coast. I haven't seen them here. Their slogan, if I remember right, is "Making the world a better place, one sandwich yeah. at a time." There you go. That's a joke <laughs> but, in a way, a little silly, yeah, but it's and, not. And, and it's you real. never trust it. You don't know how <laughs> sincere it is, but. That's no reason to believe that there's not sincerity behind a lot of successful business, but, you know, sort of the calling of business. I mean, if someone is running a a sandwich shop or a laundromat, what better measure do they have of serving society than making profits? And what better guide on how to serve society do they have? I mean, of course, there might be little interstitial little things where they're going to sacrifice profit here and there, of course, because, you know, the world's not perfectly efficient and all that stuff. And they can cut corners and do a bad yeah, thing exactly. if, they're, if they're tempted and, and opportunism under stress. Yeah, and sure. Opportunism little things mislead people and specials and so on, but um, by and large. And so in a sense, again, that, that goes back to the wealth of nation in a way being um, an extension of this because he's showing, you know, we're going to – in chapter 7 or part 7, there's the uh, – notion of distributive justice, the becoming use of what is one's own. And this raises the issue of, well, is going out and making honest profits the becoming use of one's own? Mm -hmm. And if so, then pursuing honest profits has become distributive justice. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah. Anyway, he's got the knowledge problem. And and just as you're suggesting, he he is emphasizing – Look, because of the knowledge problem, don't get carried away with benevolence. Uh, don't don't expect that impulse directly to uh, you know lead you and and uh, uh, and and dominate your your doings. Better to focus on prudence, focus on those around you. Um, but there there are, there are a couple of problems with this now. Okay, and I think this is in some sense really is getting at sort of the sort of the tensions in this part. So he's saying, okay, so focus on your prudence. Now, the thing is, people might try to aggrandize themselves and their humble departments, okay? And he's got quotes to this effect about how, um, for example, um, when he's speaking of different orders, um, every individual is naturally more attached to his own particular order of society. That could be profession, guild, I'm not sure what, than to any other. His own interest – Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, class. His own interest, his own vanity, the interest and vanity of many of his friends and companions are commonly a good deal connected with it. He is ambitious to extend its privileges and immunities. Mm. He is zealous Mm -hmm. to defend them against the encroachments of every other order of society. That could be a beneficial aspect so that there's sort of a balance of power. But 
the notion of rent seeking is 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 there. So if you just say, hey, go out and be prudent, you know, I mean, go, you know, Milton Friedman is sometimes maybe crassly caricatured as saying, you know, what corporations should care about is profit. Well, what happens when they make profit by getting privileges or handouts from the government? Um, well, that's why you put the honest profit in there. But I'm not sure Friedman did, by the way. Mm, I think he did, actually. But pr- that's another probably. Thing. Yeah. Um, so that that does lead Smith to emphasize justice. Okay, he's saying no, but if when you pursue prudence and so on, um, your kind of local beneficence, kind of near to home beneficence. Um, Mind justice, that is all important, and he stresses that again like he did earlier in the book. Don't look for privileges uh, and so on. Now, another problem is that unlike the prudent man who minds his own business in a way that he develops is very admirable, many succumb to a sense of importance in serving the larger, the, the larger departments around them. Um, and they become intoxicated with ideas of system and so on, of their own se- sense of importance, often under the sway of faction. He says they become dupes of their own sophistry. This is when he talks about different party leaders. This leads into the man of system. And so, again, you know, people pursuing prudence or their own self-interest might seem to authorize a kind of pursuit of that other kind of ambition um, or at any rate, people look for that next step in larger meaning, and very often Smith is saying um, they do so unwisely. I think he's saying that when, when, when people um, reach out, they just naturally reach out. Even if you just say, "Kind of mind your your prudence," they naturally kind of try to become more important, which in some ways can be glorious. And Smith says this. He says that you know when statesmen who have big affairs to deal with do so with a sense of, uh, for example, the liberty and independence of nations, that that's one of the most, uh, you know, admirable characters uh, a society can achieve. But so often they don't. They So often they don't. Um, and so this is a problem with this whole sort of tension of meaning-seeking, trying to limit it to what's healthy, um, and trying to check it, he doesn't have any clear resolution to this. Uh, uh, that 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 becomes very clear. Uh, did you want to break in? Or? No, I just wanted to read the Mana System quote, if I could, just because it's such a glorious quote. Yeah, uh, sure. Is that all right? Um, this this quote uh, is um, it's uh, just rather extraordinary. The man of system, on the contrary, is apt to be very to be very wise in his own conceit and is often so enamored with the supposed beauty of his own ideal plan of government that he cannot suffer the smallest deviation from any part of it. He goes on to establish it completely and in all its parts, without any regard either to the great interests or to the strong prejudices which may oppose it. He seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. He does not consider that the pieces upon the chessboard have no other principle of motion besides that which the hand impresses upon them, but that in the great chessboard of human society, every single piece has a principle of motion of its own, altogether different from that which the legislature might choose to impress upon it. If those two principles coincide and act in the same direction, the game of human society will go on easily and harmoniously and is very likely to be happy and successful. If they are opposite or different, The game will go on miserably, and the society must be at all times in the highest degree of disorder. It's a great warning, clarion warning about the dangers of um, Mm -hmm. overreaching in the political sphere. And I like how he describes every piece in human society has a principle of motion of its own. It's not simply that it's got – motion that's got its own conditions and situations and circumstances, right? It's not just that like, gee, I don't know the details of your situation. It's that we have different principles of motion. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That we're actually like different. Like I'm a knight and you're a bishop, right? Or, or a <laughs> well, rook. Oh, I didn't take it that way exactly. <laughs> but um, but that we're individual as beings. We have separate principles of motion, not merely separate 
circumstances separate within which we separate, move. Yeah, right. Um, so I think that that paragraph kind of has a certain sort of pro liberty anti planning um, resonance, and it comes after the paragraph about what uh, the good character, the man whose public spirit is prompt, prompted altogether by humanity and benevolence, should do. Um, and that man, he doesn't say, you know, particularly, you know, should sort of establish liberty or something of that nature. Um, he says rather that um, that man will respect established orders in society and content himself with merely moderating things toward betterment, um, will not force his ideas on others, will accommodate the rooted prejudices of the people like Solon, an Athenian ruler, um, when he cannot establish the right, he will not disdain to ameliorate the wrong. He will not make the best the enemy of the good. Um, he'll make reforms the best that the people can bear. Um, and, you know, I think s uh, this this pair of paragraphs, famous paragraphs about sort of the good guy and then the man of system is often um, – used to be sort of anti-planning, anti-statism, and I think, I think that's fair. But at the same time, I think that since Smith's principle, I think, is basically justice and liberty, okay, maybe that becomes even, that becomes even clearer in The Wealth of Nations. Um, given that, what these need to be taken, what these may be taken of, I think, appropriately, is that he's saying even if you're sort of a pro-liberty character, you should be like Solon. You shouldn't make it axiomatic. You shouldn't sort of try to vastly restructure society based on abolition of all these different things, at least not necessarily rapidly. Um, and it's out of a sort of prudence, perhaps, maybe a, maybe it's some sort of long-range sense of what will serve liberty um, because backlash and revolution and resistance and being deposed could be the result of um, being um, extreme and drastic. Um, well, but he, he says principle is good and even necessary, but he's sort of saying you have to realize that principles stand even after you make exceptions and that you should accommodate sort of the organic flow of society and history of society. Yeah, just, uh, just an aside about the political times he lived in, I, I – it's easy to forget that because we use Smith, people use Smith to advance their modern uh, visions of political economy. You know, he lived in a time when uh, there wasn't a lot of political liberty as we would define it. Uh, he lived in one of the most liberal states of his day, right? Yes. Uh, the 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 Britain of his day was was a liberal place relative to the rest of the world, but. It wasn't as liberal as as some places we might imagine. And he was talking about things other than Britain, right? He was talking about a world that was dominated by monarchy, uh, not by democracy of any kind. And when I hear or him talk – A rule of law might be a rule better of law, way to yeah. put it. So, so when I read about you know, the man of system, I think about you know, in the worst case scenario, we're talking about a totalitarian dictator who's imposing his utopian ideal on the world and, and, and leading to horror. Uh, in, in a less uh, frightening way, it's about some social plan to achieve some goal that isn't achievable. But, you know, for Smith, you know, he was, uh, he was living in a time when monarchy was common, but the monarchs weren't totalitarian, all of them. Some of them were, of course, but a lot of them, you know, left a great deal of liberty for the, the individual citizen to follow in at least the economic sphere, maybe not sometimes in the political sphere. But I think it's important to keep that in a little bit of perspective that um, we, we're careful not to read Smith through our eyes so much. And these, these parts and these paragraphs in particular were new to the sixth edition of 1790. Oh, really? Yes. Um, and um, – Post French Revolution. Yes, just just after right, seventeen eighty nine. Um, and incidentally, the paragraph about the good statesman, uh, the man whose public spirit is prompted by humanity and benevolence, 
a lot of that wording and ideas were taken from a letter which Dupont de Nemours wrote to Smith about how he, Dupont de Nemours was a laissez faireist a friend of Smith's and so on. And Dupont was saying to Smith about how he himself, Dupont, in a written work, sort of moderated the liberty principle because he didn't want to alienate people, shock them, you know, turn them off at first sight and so on. Um, he didn't want to challenge them too deeply. Um, and a lot of the wording and ideas of that paragraph are quite parallel to that letter and people hmm. people believe and I and I believe that Smith composed that paragraph with that letter more or less in front of him. Hmm. And so that reinforces the idea that that Smith has actually the liberty principle in mind about what is guiding the wise statesman and he's saying, you know, that's why he's not saying he's not saying, you know, Establish liberty, right? You know, abolish this and abolish yeah. that, and you know, it's a conservative, a small c conservative in some sense that way. Yeah, you could put it that way. I, um, also reminds me of Thomas Jefferson, right? A man who was quite doctrinaire when he was sitting in his study, but as president of the United States, was a different person. Either because of the constraints he faced, the incentives he faced. Uh, certainly, Bruce Wayne and a mosquito would say it's the right. incentives, but. Um, Possibly also because of, of some sort of hesitation about his own. Yeah. Well, actually, ruling to, is different than yeah. talking <laughs> yeah. about. Yeah, no doubt. You know, yeah. what, what, what the way a society <laughs> ought to be or what reforms yeah, should be. Yeah. Before making a final point, I just want to note that there's some wonderful passages about um, actually what you re- referred to about how we look up to success and power and status. And I think Smith is saying, not in these words, that we make those things focal points around which we, you know, coordinate our attitudes towards society, how things are going to be negotiated, what we're going to accept and not accept. And I think there's a rather clear statement of a sort of conventionalist view of government authority that government authority is something we sort of acquiesce to, it's focal, um, it's there, it's real. We all kind of uh, uh, accept the government as the one agent who will be sort of allowed to coerce, as it were, who will, who, from whom we'll tolerate such coercion. And this conventionalist view is, is also in Hume. Um, and it's very different than a consent view. I think it's importantly different anyway, in my view, than a consent view, which is um, the notion that, you know, there's some sort of compact or consent. Um, I think the conventionalist view lends itself much more to libertarianism or classical liberalism. It's like, yeah, the government is what it is. You know, there's no reason in being ahistoric about it. Um, <clears throat> even David Friedman writes about government in these ways as sort of the one agency um, or set of structures that we all agree to tolerate in this way, um, and that's focal. I mean, it's just it's just a, it's a convention, um, but it's not that there's any consent in it. It's just something we acquiesce to, and it is a basis of a kind of authority, but it's nothing like a contract, a social contract, or political consent, which makes it different than um, than Locke and others. And I, I felt maybe I'm. I'm just echoing what you said, and maybe, but maybe not. I felt the section you've been talking about is is how our love of country or of self can cloud our judgment about the good. And, and what I wrote in my, in my conclusion, you know, right after the man of system section, is that you know, the, for the citizen, citizen can love his country too much and do the wrong thing, and the sovereign can love himself too much and do the wrong thing. And it's – that's I guess just my way of, of maybe restating the knowledge problem, that self-awareness, that if we're not careful, our imperfect knowledge of what – of ourselves can lead us to do things that are not uh, just or benevolent. Yeah. I, I took a very strong sense of duty out of this part, which I think flows from – with what you say. Um, and the way I put it is that he's trying to impress on us a sense of duty – against gratifying our human weaknesses by resort to socially destructive uh, 
factions, fetishes, fanaticisms, identities. And that would particularly for me include like kind of statist identities, fanaticisms, fetishes, which I think now are actually pandemic in our society. Um, so, so it's a sense of duty not to indulge those fetishes. Um, and, and I do think there's an undercurrent message of de-governmentalization of society where these dangers don't arise. I mean, if, if schooling wasn't a governmental function, if, if there was a separation of school and state, just as there's a separation of church and state, there wouldn't be all these great dangers in school policy, right? It'd be like each school, each parent, each kid makes their decisions. And yeah, there are those local organic bottom-up moral externalities. Smith has a quite, you know, benign, invisible hand view of that, however. Not entirely, but I would say... He doesn't... Well, he doesn't make it explicit. I, you know, I, I'm thinking of Wealth of Nations as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't really see this in here, the degovernmentalization, other than you can argue that it, it follows from some of the things he says in that he's very trusting of the power of the impartial spectator to self-regulate uh, opportunistic and destructive behavior. And I guess the flip side of that would be uh, putting power in the hands of those who may not be able to use that spectator all the time and might be swayed by deceit, which we talked about earlier, self-deceit, might be swayed by um, uh, self-love, too much self-love, would then be destructive. Mm -hmm. There's no natural barriers to those things the way there are, or corrective mechanisms, no feedback loops, to use the modern phrase. And Smith, particularly in the in government, though, correct, he does say that in Which? the book. Remember, he says it's sort of political society is where um, virtue is least found and least rewarded. Yeah, and whereas in sort of the lower and middle classes of society, virtue is the path to security and and so on, and is and is rewarded. Yeah, but I'm not sure he's he's also I think talking about in the in the problems of. Uh, of ambition and and glittering pursuit of power. It's also talking about, I think, prestige. Yeah. It's going much beyond the political, I think. In my mind, I think he's talking – again, I, this may not be fair, but to me, I, I envision him talking about you know the dandies of upper-class uh, Britain of his day, the, the, the people who pursue, yes, political power, but also um, – Influence and prestige, uh, a critique of celebrities, uh -huh. would be the modern version of that. And I don't know if I'm. I don't know if I'm right. I don't know either. You know, I don't know what kind of celebrity there was outside of people with political status. No, it's, and that how, was the how it was achieved, and so on. Yeah, that was the dominant group. Um, Although authors and others uh, who. Mm -hmm. Poets yeah. who he criticizes yeah. in the earlier part for pursuing uh, reputation at the expense of their fellows. And uh, incidentally, you, know, you mentioned education is a very amusing, not meant to be amusing, but a very uh, powerful argument that uh, the school of life is a much better source of education than the school of the state or the private sector. He's very. Uh, uh, this, you mean homeschooling? No, no. no I mean life, the school of life. Oh, meaning, oh, oh, okay. He says basically, you know, what we learn, and this is David Henderson talks about this, I think, very eloquently uh, in his book, The Joy of Freedom, and, and elsewhere. You know, what we learn in life, m most of it doesn't come sitting at a desk, whether it's a private school or a public school. It comes from the school of hard knocks, the school of life, whatever you want to call it. But at one point, he has this sort of elo eloquent rhetorical question. I'm not going to try to find it, but where he basically says, could you ever think that you'd learn more in a in an academy than you would sitting, you know, going through the world, which is designed by God and nature to be educational? You know. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Anyway, so so that, those are some of the broad tensions I see in this section. It leaves out a, a number of very notable things, but this sense that people naturally look for meaning and and probably continuing continually larger meaning. And they naturally look for large and permanent things for that. And so there's this tendency kind of to hope and overreach perhaps, maybe get involved in these larger ideas, schemes, fetishes. But those are so often ill-judged and sort of um, corrupted 
by their own processes. He talks about leaders and how they're corrupted by their followers and end up believing their own press <laughs> and so on. Um, so it's sort of, again, I think a strong sense of duty sort of to, to sort of uh, somehow refrain from um, this kind of indulgence. Okay. And I think it's a message which we need today because I think people are much too – there look – a lot of people, I think, get a lot of their meaning in, in national politics. Yeah. I, I, I've disagreed with you on that before, is that, that I'm more, less worried about it than you are. But, but I take the point. Um, I just want to add two things before sure. we move on to part seven. What, what I took out of this whole part six, which was to me a very um, helpful – uh, part in understanding the rest of the book, part seven as well, so we'll see. But one of the challenges of this book is it's not really organized for reading. <laughs> um, having finished it now and having talked about it for 10 hours or so with Dan, I I find myself, unfortunately, thinking about reading it again, which is um, hard to countenance given how much effort it took to get through it the first time. That effort wasn't so much the, that I didn't enjoy it. I, I got a lot out of it, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about what I got out of this experience of, of reading it. But uh, it's hard going. The prose style is is it's not quite archaic, but it's um, it's it's challenging. You can't read it quickly. It's full of ideas. It's full of thoughts. But he doesn't give you much organizational uh, overview. He doesn't say he doesn't follow the classic uh, modern advice. Tell the reader what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. Uh, he lays out his thoughts and occasionally repeats himself, and he rarely says, okay, this is what we've done so far, um, and here's the, uh, here's the overview of the book. In section three, I'm going to – so w- what I found useful about this is that when I finished chap- part six, I thought – I finally learned what I think are the big three virtues for Smith. They're prudence, justice, and benevolence. Uh, they're prudence. Take care of yourself. Justice. Don't harm your neighbor. Benevolence, help your neighbor. And those are the three things that Smith cares about to me as the good life and I think the source of meaning uh, that you're talking about. And I didn't – you know, it's weird to – you know, at that point, you're about 80 percent through the book. I didn't really get that feeling until now. Um, But that's to me what the book's about. It's about prudence, justice, and benevolence. Take care of yourself. Don't harm your neighbor. Help your neighbor when you can if you're going to – and do it in a prudent way uh, that, that actually helps them. It doesn't just pretend to help them. And that we are going to learn how to do those things uh, partly through the impartial spectator. Now, there's a lot more to it than that. But but am I right in that reading, Dan, about those being the big three? Um, I don't know. I, <laughs> I certainly don't think uh, it's wrong. I'm not sure though. Um, I'm not terribly comfortable with sort of boiling it down that way. Um, it seems that self-command is a separate – might be might be categorized as a separate virtue. Oh, he has lots of other virtues, but those are the big three, and they, um, and they fit together so well. Well, I think self-command is a biggie for him because – that's, that that, that, that that's, um, fits in with uh, this sense of duty, which I so much got from part six, um, that prudence is interested in your own welfare and propriety. Benevolence is interested in other people's welfare and propriety. He says self-command is moved only by propriety. And I think he's real interested in developing these notions of propriety. Um, I think his idea of the really virtuous man, the sage, is a man who's primarily moved by Mm self-command. And where all of the other things are turned into proprieties, which are done in a kind of – out of duty. Like the prudence, it's no longer prudence that I, let's say, exercise daily. It's propriety. It's no longer benevolence that I participate in my condo association. It's propriety. Because that's what's expected of me by my peers. and Yeah. And, 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 of, and by myself. That yeah. it's become – on page 216, he's talking about prudence and then he goes up to a superior prudence – 
which I think is um, like that platonic justice, which he talks about in part seven. Um, so I'm not that comfortable kind of categorizing the world in terms of this, that's this virtue, that's this virtue, that, that one's this virtue. I think each virtue is more like a frame of analysis and any particular doings can be looked at through different frames of this and then at different levels. So I'm not sure that they're that separable and rankable or something like that. Okay, fair yeah. enough. It just helped me. Uh, mm-hmm. I have to say, I, I'm I'm still struggling with how that fits in with propriety and and self command, which are clearly very important parts of of the first parts of the book. And and uh, and uh, he sort of oscillates about that self command. We'll get into it in, in part seven. Let's turn let's turn to part seven. Before one last thing, I wanted to, I would just want to mention in six, but what command self command is in six. Yeah, well, but he gets into it in part seven. Oh, okay. He's talking about the Stoics. Okay, but sure. I, I just want to say one more thing about part six, and then we'll, we'll move on to part sure. seven. Uh, we talked about a little this. We talked a little bit about this off the air uh, before we started. Um, in his self command section, he, he makes a uh, at the end of part six. He makes this really um, beautiful statement about um, little people versus big shots, and he says, um, just really. Uh, uh, like it, he says, uh, and this is really confirming your point just now. He says, temperance, decency, modesty, and moderation are always amiable, and can seldom be directed to any bad end. It is from the unremitting steadiness of these, of those gentler exertions of self-command, that the amiable virtue of chastity, that the respectable virtues of industry and frugality, derive all that sober luster which attends them. It's a great phrase, sober luster. It's really an oxymoron. Right? Luster is grand and, and 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 shiny, and sober is like eh, not so big, uh, you know, quieter. But here, here's the punchline. He says the conduct of all those who are contented to walk in the humble paths of private and peaceable life derives from the same principle the greater part of the beauty and grace which belong to it, a beauty and grace which, though much less dazzling, is not always less pleasing than those which accompany the more splendid actions of the hero, the statesman, or the legislator. So he's saying there is that quiet, everyday, humble department success, which you mentioned earlier, is really the source of much of life's beauty and, and real contributions. And I couldn't help but be struck by the parallel between that passage and um, the last paragraph of George Eliot's Middlemarch, which I'm going to uh, which I'm going to read. She says uh, at the end of Middlemarch, uh, talking about her character uh, Dorothea, uh, the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive. For the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts, and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who live faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. And I, you know, it's a, it's a, for them, for Smith and, and, and Eliot, it was a very modern, radical idea that, that history and fiction and, what was important weren't just the kings and famous folk. It was the little people, the everyday people who made the world a better place. And I think that's a incredibly important lesson for all times, uh, but it's uh, it's clearly an important lesson for Smith. Mm-hmm. At the very end of the of part six, the last sentence is he's talking about the contributions you were just speaking of, and he says the effects are often but too little regarded. Sort of the everyday um, vigilance to do your duty, you know, to, to 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 fulfill your responsibilities, your 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 humble local duties. Um, uh, those contributions uh, are too often but little regarded. Yeah, they're the real heroes, not the people in People magazine. Or, right? uh, well, let's move on to part seven, and we're gonna we're not gonna try to be uh, exhaustive. In our coverage, there's a lot of philosophical issues there that, that I'm not familiar with, um, and we're going to mention them in passing. Uh, so I'm going to try to summarize uh, Part 7. And Dan, you can jump in when, when you wish. Um, 
and talk about some of the highlights for me of what of what the ideas were that were most important. First, it's it's striking how Smith comes out against the uh, sterile uh, homo economicus view of mankind that is sometimes parodied and unfortunately sometimes stated as fact in graduate economics programs. What Deirdre McCluskey has characterized as Max U, uh, the maximization of utility or, or or satisfaction, and a lot of people have tried to enrich that that model of human behavior with by putting altruism in it. I've written on that, um, and that's been a modern trend in economics to try to integrate uh, other motives for behavior. But ultimately, all those utility maximization models are about. Uh, self-love <laughs> of various kinds. And Smith is making a philosophical, methodological, though he's not aware of these debates that we're in the middle of now in, in 21st century, he's making a methodological point that that's not what people are about. And he does that when he criticizes um, Mandeville in particular. But he he really wants to put in this, in this whole section, uh, this whole part, he wants to put his theory in the context of other work and in doing this help the reader see what he's trying to do. He wants to differentiate himself from people who've written things that are similar to him that he wants to make it clear that he doesn't agree with. But that's one of them that, I, that struck me as the most important, essentially the way Smith is caricatured as being about self-interest and that self-interest produces good, benevolent outcomes. Smith's very eager to make it clear that that's Mandeville, not him, although he then has to backtrack and say, you know, there's, you know, it's very tempting. Mandeville has a lot of insight, and, and you might think he's right. And I think if we go back and we read Smith uh, that we talked about, I think, in the, in the third uh, part three, Smith is very eager to condemn uh, ambition and, and the lust for the material as a, as a dangerous – Pursuit, and then he says, "But look at all the good things it produces." That's very Mandevillian, but I think what Smith's really reacting to here, and he's also distinguishing himself from the Epicureans, who who said that people are motivated by self-interest and pleasure only. He's really trying to make the point that you know, obviously people care about pleasure, obviously people have self-love, obviously people are motivated by self-interest, but he, he basically says, if that's what you think the human enterprise is about. You're an idiot. You, you've missed the whole thing. And that really comes back, I think, to your point, Dan, that, that where meaning comes from. He never says it that way. He never says you get your meaning from helping others or being part of a larger enterprise but he's, or, what, or from what other people think of you. Uh, he never says that's where you get your meaning from. But it's clear that's what he believes. He believes that the human enterprise uh, is about uh, – that richer view of what motivates people, it's almost um, – it verges on idealistic or almost romantic in certain ways. But for Smith, it was, it was clearly – this is a positive, not just a normative view that what motivates people to do the right thing and the reason people do the right thing isn't because they think they're going to get richer later or they think they're going to go to heaven. So it's really all boils down to self-interest. He really thought that deep down inside the human soul was a desire to be good at, in certain ways, to help others, and that that was a fundamental drive. And so for me, uh, that distinction between – and you can debate whether that's important or not, right? You can debate whether – uh, leaving that out, say, in your economic models, and that when you're trying to figure out the demand for shirts, you know, as he would say, oh, that's fine. You don't have to worry about altruism and benevolence and, and fellow feeling and sympathy. But Smith is really trying to give us, to me in this book, what he's trying to give us is a view of human nature, of, 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 of mankind, human beings as they are. And he's saying that's a huge part of who we are. And it just I, I can't emphasize it enough because it, it makes me sad. To think that this guy wrote this masterwork about this, and he gets treated like he's, uh, you know, some wild self, you know, only Gary cares Becker. about self-interest. What? Gary Becker. Yeah, a, a man <laughs> who I respect a great deal. Yeah, but, I, but I, I, yeah. You're teasing me, probably, but and, I'm, my, and I, don't, I respect him as well. He was my thesis advisor, <laughs> so uh, I, I would say not Gary Becker. I would say. You know, just the Mandevillian view that that people are fundamentally selfish, which is ironic, of course, because as an economist, we spend a lot of time on incentives and we spend a lot of time on self-interest, and we should. But Smith's saying that's got to be embedded in a richer 
view of who we are as people and where we and most yeah. importantly your point where we get our meaning and this it that, and that goes back to the whole sympathy as i mean the the meaning is sort of in the sympathy with and whom we have sympathy with um how durable it is then maybe the more meaningful is the the recurrent maybe he calls affection habituated sympathy mm-hmm. okay so maybe affection is a bit more like meaning like a, a longer term sympathetic experience and um that indeed is what he suggests is uh, the most important part of human well-being, human concern. And um, if anything, the comforts, the material things are pursued to serve that, whereas most people, or at least often economists, turn it around and say that people are only you know, sociable and act concerned because they're interested in the material welfare, right. the security, the... I don't know, some kind of now or thing. And that's right. And, and, and then he does have a view, I think you're right, that people have they, – they search for this sympathetic experience, this moral experience. It's also, a, it's also an aesthetic experience. And I do think he thinks that people generally are looking for – looking to get it right, as it were. Yeah. Looking – naturally looking to sort of widen it. And hence, line it up more properly with a larger rightness or goodness. But at the same time, I think he's saying very often when people get beyond their knitting, they get it wrong. Yeah. But but it's a, it's a surprisingly optimistic view of human nature. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sections in this book about self-deceit, uh, the, our ability to fool ourselves that what we're doing is really f- right when it's really for our own self-interest. But you know, he he believes deeply that there is the man in the breast, that there is that impartial specter. Definitely. So there's a weird tension in the book, which at least I found, between the positive and the normative. He's talking about human nature as it is, and he's also talking about human nature as he hopes it can be. And that we've talked before about how in many passages there's an evolutionary theme about – for an individual over his own lifetime – that you can get better at this. As you say, you can habituate yourself to thinking of others. And so he's he's a combination of social scientist and preacher for me in this book. He's very mm-hmm. much bouncing back and forth. And this is why I think the book is so difficult to read. He bounces back and forth between describing the way people are versus how they can be, the way they ought to be, the way they should be. And he, he wasn't saying they're like that all the time. There's always the impartial specter. But he's saying if you want to judge what's – Right, use the impartial spectator. Um, so to come back to the themes, he starts off in this mm-hmm. part with with what is virtue and why do we act virtuously? And he reviews the intellectual history of these ideas. And he talks about schools of thought that looked at one thing. You know, the Stoics looked at propriety, somebody else looks at prudence, somebody else looks at benevolence. So he's sort of he's giving you their he gives an overview of each of these systems. Um, and and he's going to reject all three by themselves as being insufficient. But he's going to also look at how people defended them when they were defending them as the sole virtue. You know, the Stoics it was very entertaining. There's a long set of discussions about suicide and the Stoics. Russ, read the yeah. first several sentences of the part just to remind the reader of how proud Smith is of his theory. So this is uh, part seven, section one, page 265, this passage here. Uh, Just from the start. That's the start of the section. If we examine the most celebrated and remarkable of the different theories which have been given concerning the nature and origin of our moral sentiments, we shall find that almost all of them coincide with some part or other of that which I have been endeavoring to give an account of. And that if everything which has already been said be fully considered, we shall be at no loss to explain what was the view or aspect of nature, which led each particular author to form his particular system. From some one or other of those principles which I have been endeavoring to unfold, every system of morality that ever had any reputation in the world has perhaps ultimately been derived. As they are all of them in this respect founded upon natural principles, they are all of them in some measure in the right. But as many of them are derived from a partial and imperfect view of nature, there are many of them too in some respects in the wrong. Mm. 
And he's really going to, in this whole part, lay out those visions, talk about what was right about what was wrong. Uh, and one of the themes in this first part of the part seven is that these individual focusing on one virtue while, you know, there's something to be said for it. They, they didn't get the whole thing. And, and then for me, an amusing passage, Smith defends his own system, which he does periodically through this. It's very confusing, this whole thing, this whole part for me, because sometimes he's talking in the voice of, of say, Hobbes, and it sounds like he's talking in his own voice. He's not. He's, he's actually talking about Hobbes because then he says, well, it's ridiculous or it's wrong. Uh, but he, he comes back a couple places and he just says, you know, they were on to something, but they didn't have – and I, for me, what the punchline almost always is they didn't have the impartial spectator. They didn't have this idea that we derive our moral sense or our sense of how to behave or how we should behave, which are two different things. We derive this from looking at how others would look at us if they were impartial. And um, and our sympathy with that spectator. Yeah, right. So our willingness say- to enter into that mental experiment. Um, on prudence, he breaks with the sterile view of utility maximization, as I said before. Uh, on benevolence, while he admires much of Hutchison – he breaks with Hutchison uh, basically saying, if, if benevolence is the only virtue, why do I feel so much approval when I see a prudent man? If benevolence is the whole thing, which is uh, apparently – I've never read Hutchison, but if, if, if benevolence is the is, – which is a good argument. What could be more virtuous than benevolence? That would be – should be the be-all and end-all, but his, he has two criticisms of that view. One is, why do I feel inside respect? For a prudent person, a person who either has self-command, as you talked about, uh, or who who thoughtfully, pers- you know, f- has sacrifices today to get something tomorrow, and his argument again is a very uh, divine or providential, or if you're not a believer, uh, or if you think Smith's being uh, is masking something, an evolutionary view. His view is that if that's inside us, then that should count. If we feel that respect and admire and approve of the prudent man, clearly prudence is a virtue, not just the person who extends a hand to the poor, say. Uh, he savages Mandeville for his narrow view of self-interest. talked about that already. And then in section three, he turns to the what he calls the principle of approbation, which is I think a little bit difficult for the modern reader. But I think of this as moral judgment, what determines what we approve of and what we disapprove of. And um, – he says there have been three arguments through history, self-interest, reason, and emotion or sentiment. But then he gives his four senses of approval, which we talked about in the very first podcast. Um, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to summarize the way I've read this and then I want you to respond, Dan. Um, okay. His four senses of approval, um, which he's saying I think are richer than, than the historical literature on this area, to me that ties in very deeply and I think – this is what you were saying in the first podcast. I didn't understand it at the time before I read the book. Um, the way I understand it is that if you want to do the right thing, he says it's really hard to know. Hard to know what the right thing is. He says, sometimes it's obvious, and those are the principles of justice we talked about that are like grammar. There are certain things you, know, you don't burn down your neighbor's house because you're mad at him. You don't steal his cow because you, you're hungry. Uh, or like his cow or wish you want to sell it. Uh, and those are the grammar rules. But he says most of life, uh, how you should behave, say, toward a friend, how you should behave in a system of – in a time of, of of a challenging decision to make, that's the loose, vague, and indeterminate rules of style uh, that apply here equally – with equal force, meaning it, yeah, you have to kind of go on a case-by-case basis. And he – he looks – he criticizes – I don't know how you pronounce it – the casuists, the, the, the churchmen who, who argued that, that maybe you could develop a manual of what to do in every situation, a set of rules. Um, and he rejects that and I think correctly as impossible because of the complex nature of life. So in that complex nature of life, what's a person to do who wants to be a moral person, who wants to be ethical? And he says you can't lay down – explicit rules. Instead, he lays down a system, these four sources of approval that is fundamentally based on this impartial spectator, the man within the breast. So if you're not sure what to do, if you're, if you're in a dilemma and you want to be a, a – in Yiddish, you'd say you want to be a mensch. In his language, you want to be a gentleman. 
uh, some would say a bourgeois. In modern language, you say you want to be a good guy. You want to do the right thing. You've got to step back, step outside yourself, and think about someone who would be judging you, who would not have your self-interest to complicate the matter, who would be pretty fully informed, ideally, but impartial. So it's a spectator who keeps you in line. And, and also a spectator, as it were, looking in four different ways in so this talk, case. So let's move to those four senses of approval. Okay. Um, <clears throat> he says – well, he says, when we approve of any character or action, the sentiments which we feel are according to the foregoing system – that's his own – derived from four sources, which are in some respects different from one another – First, we sympathize, sympathize with the motives of the agent. Okay, so first, uh, what moves Jim to do what he's doing. Second, we enter into the gratitude, and you might add, or resentment or other reaction, of those who receive the benefit or effects of his action. Consider that. Third, we observe that his conduct has been agreeable to the general rules by which those two sympathies generally act. That's a sort of sense of setting and propriety to norms. To norms and sort of whether these this interactions, you know, being done in the right place at the right time and so on. And last of all, and again, this is the one that throws it wide open, when we consider such actions as making a part of a system of behavior which tends to promote the happiness either of the individual or of the society, they appear to derive a beauty from this utility not unlike that which we ascribe to any well-contrived machine. So that's throwing it, stepping way back and is um, getting as wide-angle lens as I guess you can get to think about how this fits into larger Scheme of humanity, uh, the concatenation, the great concatenation. Well, when you first talked about that, I really – I had my own vision of what that was. I haven't read the book. I, I have a better idea, I think, of what what Smith meant. And and when we first talked about it, and as you talked about it here, you talk about Jim. So I'm watching Jim. Jim's doing something to his neighbor, with his neighbor. I'm going to look at Jim's motivation. I'm going to look at the impact on the neighbor. I'm going to look at whether it's sort of socially uh, not disruptive by – being offbeat or weird or cause other things. And then the fourth is sort of the law of unintended consequences. But having read the book now, it, it seems to me that, that Smith is also talking about not just Jim but me. When I'm in Jim's shoes and I'm going to decide what to do with my neighbor, whether to help him, hurt him, smile at him on him when I'm having a bad day, when he's having a bad day, uh, I should step back and think about that spectator judging me as if I were Jim. And that's one – You know, we talked about the unpeeling of the onion, the layers. That's, that's one of these sort of circles within circles or whatever you want to call it, self-reflective uh, situations. The second thing is that, that fourth part, which I think of when, when I first heard you say it, I thought of you know, the full impact, the law of unintended consequences, the seen and the unseen. And I think that's all true. It certainly is important to think about those things. But I think for Smith – what I didn't appreciate when we first started talking about it, for Smith, he really saw much of what we do as moral actors as having this harmonious uh, – I don't know how, you, how, to, how to say it that, – that it's part of a grand system. And in his mind, or at least the way he writes about it, it's providential. Uh, it, it's part of what makes life work well. And we talked in one of the podcasts about this – Aligning of incentives, uh, which is kind of a crude way to talk about it, but that you know, if you work hard and you're prudent and you're industrious, you get rich. And if you do the right thing and you are benevolent and you follow justice, then you get a good reputation and you're, and in your own eyes and in the eyes of your fellows. So there are these implicit rewards built into the fabric of human nature to make the world work well. And it seems to me part of what he's saying in that fourth part is that you know you you, you want to be part of this this big thing. You, you want to make sure that that you're aware of this this whole system, and and you do your part. And I think that is uh, that whole idea of of sympathy and reputation for him is is a way of creating the harmony across all these different people and all these different decisions. And I'm rambling now, so I'm going to stop. No, that that. That makes perfect sense, and and 
in private society and civil society, I think he is optimistic. He is saying you have to be responsible. I mean, you could imagine Jim and his neighbor being, you know, two guys planning to rob the Seven <laughs> Eleven, and they, you know, cooperate with each other. They're honest with each other. They share with each other. Um, but sort of at the third and fourth levels, it's a total failure, you know, like mafiosas or pirates for that matter. Yeah. Um, and um, in I do think he's very optimistic that sort of in private society, which this book is officially pitched at. Remember, it's the it's how we judge of our first of ourselves and then of our neighbors. That's the subtitle of the book from, I think, the fourth edition on. And um, it's not pr- pr- principally about political society. And I do think you're, you're right that he's saying in private society, ten- these four sources do tend to converge. To do tend to be in touch with each other such that they tend to um, adjust to each other um, so that our proprieties, our senses of proprieties for each of them come maybe even, even in an evolutionary sense to uh, align each with that of the other. Um, but then again, of course, I do think there's this issue of um, – in political society, in a more politicized society, this fourth source might not be well connected to the other sources. There may not be those healthy bottom-up feedback mechanisms. Mm -hmm. The whole notions of propriety, the whole press or image or what is seen in certain actions, policy actions, say, in particular, um, are very much, um, you know, manufactured things in politics and based on political notions of intention and certain effects at that fourth level are basically silenced, erased, muted, right? Um, But, you know, I do think, again, to go back to what we said at the very outset, he wrote The Wealth of Nations to help us understand that fourth fourth source better to help us understand that when your neighbor is out there making a sawmill to pursue profits, don't be so critical. Don't get down on his ambition. This is, I think, a kind of ambition that Smith would approve of. Um, uh, If he's going to make profits by building a sawmill or whatever, a printing press, what have you, um, he does that because he's serving customers. It's actually the invisible hand. It's actually something we should um, certainly tolerate and perhaps even admire. And as for what the statesman should do or the legislator should do in relation to this, I think he was saying that it's under the principles of natural liberty, by and large, under those principles, that um, that confluence that you were just talking about works out. And we do sort of all, in some sense, learn to contribute to and participate in sort of broader social projects, right, and and, and, and sentiments. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I'm just fascinated by the, the you know, invoking Wealth of Nations, and let's turn to that now for our closing thoughts. Uh, I want you to try to put the book in context. You've done it just now a little bit. I'd like you to maybe do a little bit more. Um, let me give you my naive reading of of uh, having only read it once now and but talked about it a lot uh, of the context. So for me, it's very difficult. Um, I think one of the reasons that Smith gets caricatured as a self-interest only guy is because he's got this famous passage. It's not from the benevolence of the butcher and the baker that we get our, our meat and our, our bread. Uh, to people then falsely conclude that Smith thought there wasn't any benevolence. He was right. It's not from their benevolence that they work hard all, all night and get up at three in the morning so that the bread's fresh at the at the local break, bakery. That's mainly self, self-love. self That's mainly self-interest. They're not getting up at four in the morning to make – because they're worried I'm not going to get a hot, a hot uh, fresh bagel. They're worried about themselves that if I have an alternative to shop at that does, they're going to lose their money. But – that doesn't lead to the conclusion that then people can't be benevolent or have multiple motives and get pleasure from the idea that people are having breakfast with their bread and and all that. So on the sort of methodological view of Smith, you know, I don't have any problem with uh, having the richer view of humanity that Smith gives us the uh, – and also that the coarse clay view that, that, that people are imperfect. 
having said that, I read this – I started this enterprise, Dan, thinking I was going to learn a, a lot about Smith and, and The Wealth of Nations, a book that I'm more familiar with and that I really have learned an immense amount from. And I have to say that having finished the book, it didn't really – that payoff wasn't there. I don't really understand – uh, why it's important to read this book alongside The Wealth of Nations other than to give a f more fair view of Smith's view of human nature. So that's point one. Point two is I found reading this book and talking about it with you to be a really extraordinary intellectual experience despite that caveat I just gave, which is it didn't – I didn't get the payoff. I didn't get the benefit I thought I was going to get. I thought I was going to get this richer view of, the, of Smith, a richer view of the wealth of the nation. I get a richer view of Smith, but it didn't really help me as an economist much. What it's helped me think about a lot is human, human nature uh, and morality, and I found it to be a deeply affecting and, and thought-provoking experience to read this book totally on its own, totally outside of the context of the wealth of nations uh, as a – as a work that talks about uh, what do we know about about human beings and what do we think they can and ought to be. And so as a work of pure philosophy or ethics uh, or social science, I found it to be a rather extraordinary read. And again, from say part three on, I think anybody would profit from reading it uh, and, and enjoy most of it. But I struggle to understand its implications for me as an economist today. I like your themes of private versus public. Uh, I think those are incredibly important about where we get our satisfactions from and, and the dangers of, of public versus private. But um, for me, this was a was a personally a very gratifying experience, intellectually very gratifying. But I don't I don't see it as important for for the well, larger economics enterprise, except when we've talked about some places where it is in terms of thinking about behavioral economics, talking about uh, a richer view of motivation. But um, do you need to read this book before you read The Wealth of Nations? Or should you, do you need to read it anytime as an economist? Um, <clears throat> well, you need to read it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, or at least listen to the podcast. And that includes economists. <laughs> um, I take I take I take what you're saying. I do think the wealth of nations makes sense without having read this, and I'm not sure that reading this alters anything you had thought when reading the wealth of nations before. Um, I do still I don't know I do still uh, I still think of Smith as a whole myself, and based on this larger project, uh, and I do see. The theory of moral sentiments is the wider umbrella and the wealth of nations still as um, sort of something nested within that. So talk about that in, in closing as a – because I, you, know, you, you talked about that in the first podcast. Uh, for us, that was many pages ago and many hours ago and for some listeners, it may have been months ago because people don't always – aren't always going to listen to these in, in order. Mm -hmm. So um, – Talk about the enterprise of, of liberty and, and why you think this is such an important umbrella to put over it. Well, I think the theory of moral sentiments is sort of asking at the broadest possible level, in some sense about that platonic justice, which is on pages uh, 269, 270, um, right behavior, right characters, like we've been talking about, characters that are useful to themselves and to society – um, which means their purposes um, and and the kinds of behaviors they do, um, and the wealth of nations is really taking that question up, particularly in the context of um, policy, public policy, or what he calls at the end of uh, this book, um, police, arms, and revenue. I think it is it's the last paragraph of the book. Yeah. Um, and, and what that means is policy. When he says police in sort of modern parlance, that, that would be policy and taxes and national defense. And that's, that's more or less what Wealth of Nations is. He also promised in this paragraph a treatise on natural jurisprudence, which is what he never wrote. And the closest thing we have are his lectures on jurisprudence, which is more, I think, about what is justice? What is the grammar? What are the details of the grammar? 
you know, rather than just saying there's grammar and it's that, you know, not to mess with other people's person, property, and promises due from contract, you know, it's the more detailed punctuation, as it were, yeah. of those things, which he never, um, you know, developed and published. Um, but the wealth of nations, in some sense, I think, is proper character, proper morals, proper ethics, um, um, in respect to these issues of state, really, as well as commercial behavior, I think also as well as people's attitudes about commerce and acceptance of commerce and so on. So I, I do see it part of this nested thing, uh, this larger question of what's the good society, what are going to be our broadest focal points, our broadest impartial spectators and their their sensibilities. Um, and I do think that uh, a big part of the message – developed in the wealth of nations is that we should have a presumption of liberty, of natural liberty, which is basically like the government respecting commutative justice as though it were our equal, right? The government not messing with our stuff either. Now, he allows exceptions. It's not an axiom. And he goes through exceptions and there's a good number. We haven't detailed those, but there's probably like a dozen at least worth talking about. Some of them are hedged and fudged and so on. Some of them like usury and um, small denomination notes and the options <laughs> clause and banking and so on are quite clear. But in each case, when he sides with um, the intervention, with the contravention of liberty, he assumes the burden of proof in justifying the intervention, even if it's the status quo, which they almost always are, by the way, which I think is interesting and important. Um, so he, he, the presumption of liberty says that, you know, we, we go with liberty. Uh, you know, we're, we're not out to sort of just look at the facts, the truth. Let's just, you know, discover the truth and then decide. It's No, that's not the way philosophy really works. And this is developed in his, in his astronomy essay that we kind of develop threads of ideas to interpret things. And our threads are such that um, in this matter, this area, we should have this presumption of liberty for all these reasons I've collected in these two big books, um, which means that the burden of proof should be on the interventionist, okay? And, and I think he'd say even in the case where the intervention is the status quo. So I think it's a strong presumption of liberty. So that's kind of um, – what I see as his big political message, really, and, it, and, and, and as a political principle, I think liberty does have a broader cultural impact because it means a free market society. It means diverse culture. It, means, it may mean fragmentation and so on. And I think he's basically saying, you know, go with it. Don't try to – you know, the toothpaste is coming out of the tube. Don't try to keep it in the tube, or at least not too much. Maybe a little bit, okay? Maybe that's part of his exceptions. Um, but basically, it's going to be coming out of the tube and learn to live with that, have confidence that it'll work out okay. Um, but another thing about the theory of moral sentiments is that I feel that in this book, you get the sense that Smith develops a commitment to liberty actually in this book. I actually feel that there's a very strong libertarian strain in this book that Smith goes into the writing of The Wealth of Nations thinking, I mean, with an open mind and all, but basically like I have to explain in all these other ways that liberty is practical and useful and can be deemed proper. Um, and so he explains um, economics and so on, the dysfunctionality of interventions, right, the pathologies of interventions. But in a sense, I don't think that's really his primary, as it were, his primary um, grounds or warrant for liberty. I think his primary warrants for liberty are actually more in this book and about um, that bottom-up principle, self-government, um, greater faith in the culture of depoliticized society, um, that humankind is at its best when it's active and hence always has to be thinking about the next level of improvement and perfection, something we didn't get to talk about from part six. Um, so in, in one way, I think that the wealth of nations is read a little differently in light of this. If, if, if you read this book, Theory of Moral Sentiments, this way, 
is that he's not really trying is, – is that in the Wealth of Nations, um, <clears throat> you know, it's not about nationalizing – uh, national income, gross national product, that's his be-all and end-all, his, his moral code. Right. You see that, that that's better placed within a sort of wider array of considerations. Um, and this book assures you that it's the wider array that are the real warrants. But these other – all these other things and how they play out are important too um, and certainly relate to all those broader warrants – um, it's not as though they're separable, the economic effects and the social effects or the moral effects. Um, so, um, I don't know. That's a little no, bit about the umbrella. Help. No, that's very helpful. And I, let me, let me react to it. Dan, you're, you're more of uh, a lot more of a philosopher than I am. So the book has an independent interest to you, uh, outside of economics. But I, what I think is interesting is that for me, I've moved much more in the direction of economics as a philosophy and less as a as a science, uh, partly under the influence of uh, these podcasts. So those of you who've been listening uh, prior to this, that you've heard some of the evolution of my thinking on this and my skepticism. And um, I think there's a tendency, putting on my old hat as a standard economist, to say, well, wealth of nations – that's Smith, a social scientist. This is Smith, as you know, philosopher. But the fact is, they're really the same thing. Um, and you could argue, and maybe this is kind of what you're saying. I'm not sure. It's certainly what I'm thinking. That 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 this book, the theory of moral sentiments, is about how the world works when you pretty much leave it alone. To, to come to your presumption of liberty argument, that don't don't think that. Like Mr. Hobbes, that, that life is nasty, brutish, and short. It, it, it has many ennobling uh, – we have many ennobling and noble impulses within us. We want to be praised and we want to be praiseworthy. And if that's your view of humanity – and it's not, it's not, a, it's not a rosy-eyed view. <laughs> view. It's not a that, – that, that's not the essence of man. But, but we want to be praised and we want to be praiseworthy. And we have our self-interest at the same time. That going back to our earlier conversation a little bit in this podcast and some in the last one, there's this invisible hand that without the power of the state directs people to do the right thing some or maybe even much of the time. That those – that there's a web of, of interactions, uh, not just a web of the woolen coat, which he talks about in, in The Wealth of Nations about how we cooperate, this – great concatenation that the way Dan likes to describe it, but that there's a moral web that keeps us in line, that the, the stigma and pride and reputation and prestige and self-esteem all work together to create a pretty good world most of the time. And I think, you know, to come back to the classic example that this book gets quoted a lot for, the Chinese earthquake story, uh, He's not a he's not a fool. He doesn't say that that people are uh, worried a lot about the Chinese. He very eloquently describes the way which we talk about such disasters after an earthquake as being forgotten after 15 minutes. And yet he says we don't act as if they were unimportant, even though we feel that way. So he had a deep belief that there were things inside us that were self-regulating both in the literal sense of self-restraint, self-command, but in the larger social sense of, of what's opportunistic and what pr prevents that. So in that sense, I do see it very much as part of the enterprise uh, of liberty. And when I put on my political economy hat writ it large – being this one. This one. Yeah, when I put on my political economy hat writ large, when I ask, uh, you know, how do we – what is the purpose of, of – uh, how do we get to the good life? How do we create the, the, the good society? How do we create a world we want our children and grandchildren to live in? Uh, I don't want to embrace the view that says, well, we want to be free because that maximizes GDP and, and I want my kids to be rich. I don't think most people feel that way. I think they think I want my kids to have a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think that's where economics to a large extent has gone wrong uh, through – the social incentives, and the, some of them are, are, are the profit motive, 
a lot of economists you know, spend their time talking about what's good for the economy as if it was a separate entity from, from us. Uh, we emphasize the material because it's measurable rather than the than the non tangible things that give life its meaning. And and I, um, you know, I've if if you've read my books out there, you know, I'm deeply interested in the parts of economics that give life meaning, not just give life material well being. And without having thought about it until really just now, this book is is deeply related to that enterprise, the the meaning seeking you talked about Absolutely. earlier, and also just. Uh, What's important in life? And you see that more in the Wealth of Nations, I think, after you've read this. Um, you know, he is often interested in talking about wealth, but there's a lot in the Wealth of Nations where he shows that that's not any ultimate good or anything of that nature. One example I'd like to mention in the Wealth of Nations is when he's arguing against mercantilism and the idea of manipulative policies trying to store up and stock up, uh, hoard up gold and silver uh -huh. and how that's supposed to be good, somehow good uh, for the people, for the country, uh, keeping more gold in the country. And he says there's no reason that people should have more gold or silver, you know, around and in their possession than they otherwise would. And it, and it, and it makes no more sense than saying that policies that somehow induced families to have more pots and pans than uh -huh. they naturally would would create more good cheer of private families. He says, he, so, so it's like he goes back to this higher good, and how does he characterize it? The good cheer of private families, yeah. which uh, you know, speaks a lot to this book about the people you live with, about it being moral, some kind of spiritual feeling of cheer, not about whatever possession. Well, there's, you know, there's definitely a tension in, that, in, in this book and The Wealth of Nations and in my view of, of the economics profession enterprise between uh, saying it's not all about money, but it does matter, right? So Smith will say, boy, it's stupid to be overly ambitious and for your eyes to be bigger than your stomach and to, think you, and to, to try to accumulate. But he says that creates a lot of employment for people and they get a decent life as a result. And then at one point he talks about how uh, you know, there shouldn't be jealousy between nations, Really wonderful passage we didn't talk about. You know, he said, he said it's great when other nations succeed when they create things for, for us and, and for themselves, and that's what makes life better. So he certainly believes in progress, in material progress, because and I and I do too, because uh, money isn't everything, but it's not nothing. You know, it's hard to be a spiritual person seeking meaning when you're starving to death. Um, I think that the challenge in life is is that balance uh, between. Uh, Spending your time in pursuit of the material and, and spending your time in pursuit of what's, what is truly meaningful and it's hard to keep them straight sometimes. And as economists, we certainly have trouble keeping them straight. Well, this is, uh, this is our, our last podcast. It's hard to believe on the, on the theory of moral sentiments. And in honor of that, I, I'm proposing a toast and I, I have here a couple of, uh, of glasses. I'm going to give one to, to Dan. They're plastic. I'm sorry, Dan. That's fine. And my toast is I'm choosing a, a single malt scotch, uh, which I think is appropriate given the um, origins of Mr. Smith. And I have to say that this is a – I brought a – I thought it would be a little bit untoward to bring in a, gla a bottle into to work. I don't know why a flask is better, but somehow it seems uh, this, of the seen and the unseen. A bottle is seen and a flask is in theory unseen. But this flask is uh, – not sure what's in it. Uh, I know it's single malt scotch, and I'm pretty sure it's Glen Morangi, which is probably my third favorite scotch. Uh, and it, but it's it's the less smoky of the scotches that I love, and so it's more likely to be enjoyed by people who aren't used to the smoky ones. Uh, if you're not a single malt scotch fan, I want to warn you. Uh, I tell my children who want to try it. I have uh, four kids: sixteen, fourteen, eleven, and nine. Uh, the 14, 11, and 9-year-olds are all boys. They're all eager to try it. My daughter's not so interested in scotch, but they all want to try it. And I've let them try beer and wine, and but they've never tried scotch. And I said, you know, first of all, it's very strong. But second of all, it's very expensive. And it's probably a habit that's best uh, enjoyed after about the age of 40 uh, when you can afford it. Now, I'm going to give Dan some here. Now, Dan, uh, do you want more than that or less? Oh, that looks fine. Okay. Hang on here. 
So Thank you. Uh, this is um, a toast. Let me let me tighten the flask here. Uh, my my toast is to, of course, uh, my I think my favorite Scot, other than the ones who make this great um, single malt Scotch. My favorite Scot would be uh, Adam Smith, uh, but also to Dan Klein, my colleague, who has been our incredible. Um, guide, and I never would have imagined uh, doing this without him, and um, I can't believe um, we've actually done it. It's been an extraordinary personal and intellectual experience for me. Uh, I want to thank uh, Toast, besides Adam Smith and Dan Klein, Lauren Landsberg, who runs the entire Econ Live site and who does the incredible highlights for this, uh, Rich Goyette, the sound engineer who makes us sound so good, and Liberty Fund for making this extraordinary experience possible. Um, Here's to all those folks. I want to thank you again, Dan. Smooth. <laughs> <laughs> but same back at you, Russ, and everyone, Lauren, and everyone at Liberty Fund, and of course, most of all, Adam Smith. And all you out there listening, I should add, who um, uh, it's a weird thing. We're you know we're immersed in this 250 year old book, and uh, I know some of you out there. are are um, are reading along, some of you are listening along, some of you are expecting to listen along, listening to parts of it. But uh, thanks for being part of a larger community that um, it's been wonderful interacting with you. I wish there were more interaction along uh, through the experience, but uh, it's a new technology. We're just getting the hang of it. See you soon. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>